And my brief is to cover uh, your classification, the jewelry type 2, which corresponds to the choid type 4B, which is the most catastrophic of all the sequelae of septic arthritis of the hip, and that is a missing femoral head because that's really a very, very difficult problem. So that can happen either because of septic arthritis of the hip, which results in destruction of the femoral head because of the enzymatic uh, proteolysis of the cartilage, or as in this case, as you can see, there's been an extension of the osteomyelitis of the metaphysis going down into the shaft and up into the metaphysis of the femur, uh, causing a destruction of the femoral head. And you can see over time, over a period of a few weeks, how the entire femoral head gets resolved and destroyed because of the infection which has progressed from the metaphysial focus. So this, as we have said, is a Johri type 2, which corresponds to the Choi type 4B. And this can be quite disabling to the child. As you can see, uh, what you can see uh, right there is not the femoral head, but actually the trochanteric apophysis. The femoral head is completely missing from uh, its place in the acetabulum. And the child will present with a hyperlotic gait, very similar to a bilateral hip dislocation with a severe lurch and also shortening. So as so has explained to you, I think this is the most difficult type to treat because it, it has all the problems that, uh, are, uh, that are present in the sequel of a septic hip. Not only is there deformity, but there's very severe instability because of the absence of the femoral head. There is a vertical telescoping that occurs every time the child walks. There's a very disabling abductor lurch. And because you have lost the growth potential from the proximal femur, there will be a limb length discrepancy as well. So here you can see a gait of a child who has a right-sided uh, jewelry type 2 uh, axis of the femoral head. And unlike a hip dislocation, you can see that the lurch is much more because there's no stability at all to the proximal femur. And you can see when he stands on that affected limb, how much the pelvic dips down and a very positive Fredenberg test, which is not even seen in a dislocated hip. So this really becomes very disabling to the child. It causes a huge amount of instability, telescopy, and a limb and discrepancy that all needs to be addressed when we are looking at the treatment of this condition. So, sir put up the slide earlier, and here are the various options that have been reported in literature. As you can, as you are, can imagine, there would be very few cases because this is not a very common presentation, and very few cases are there in literature about the various different types of interventions that could be done. And my brief is to speak about the role of the colonna trochanteric arthroplasty. So here's an example of a 12-year-old boy who has this type of uh, absence of the femoral head, which is a toy type 4B or the Johari type 2. And you can see that's a well-developed trochanter. And the good thing is that the acetabulum here is fairly well-developed. So I think one of the most important criteria to decide whether this procedure will succeed or fail. That's what we have found in the limited series of patients that we have treated with this procedure. So here what we did is through a, a, a lateral and a combined anterior approach, we first have uh, remove the abductor origin from the greater trochanter and then put the greater trochanter into the acetabulum. We have created an osteotomy below so as to create a sort of a neck shaft angle. And then because obviously this is extremely unstable, we have fixed it temporarily with a K wire. And you can see right away at uh, a one year follow up that that trochanter seems to be fairly well looking into the acetabulum, though there is a gradual subluxation and some correction of the virus that we had given initially. So this child then subsequently required a further procedure of Chiari osteotomy to improve the coverage. And at the short follow-up of seven years post, when the child is now skeletally mature and 19 years old, he has got a fairly good range of motion. He has no pain. He's able to squat and sit cross-legged, as you can see from this video. So in the short term, uh, at skeletal maturity with a seven-year follow-up, this child is doing pretty well. I don't know how long this hip will last. Obviously, at some point, uh, the child will need a, a hip replacement surgery, but we have been able to buy some time at least with this procedure. So from the very modest series that we've had, uh, we have very strict selection criteria as to which patients would benefit from this procedure. I think the key here, of course, is to have a acetabulum which is fairly well developed because if you have a, a non-existent acetabulum, it'd be very difficult to contain the trochanter within, uh, within the acetabulum. We had about nine patients and uh, almost 70 to 80% of them had a fairly good range of motion, especially in flexion extension with some amount of some abduction. Uh, many of them were able to squat, but two of them land up with a stiff hip. So I think the patient selection is very important. And despite your best efforts, you sometimes may get a suboptimal result. 
because of stiffness. So I think one of the biggest uh, reports came out from Weston in 1980, where he talked about the Kelowna trochanteric arthroplasty. He had about 17 children, which is a fairly large number, with a follow-up ranging from 2 to 20 years. And what he found is that fairly good stability and range of motion could be achieved in most cases. The greater trochanter surprisingly remodels to resemble the femoral head. But one problem that we have also faced is to see the gradual subluxation that tends to occur as the child grows. According to him, the best results are seen in children nearing skeletal maturity. And as we have shown from our, that one study, that I, one example that I showed you, the best results are obtained if you combine the trochanteric arthroplasty with a simultaneous or a staged femoral valve and an acetabuloplasty. So this is again another case of ours where you can see that how well the, the greater trochanter has remodeled, almost looking like the femoral head over a follow-up of about four or five years. So this is a worthwhile procedure to do uh, when you have all the criteria that are fulfilled for a trochanteric arthroplasty. Another paper that came out more recently was from Terry Shoniker. He had a smaller group of patients, but again, a fairly good follow-up of 10 to 20 years. And conversely, he showed here that most of his patients were in fact younger at two and a half years. Again, 90% of patients had pain-free hips, a good range of motion. Only one had a spontaneous ankylos. And according to him, the optimum age for surgery may in fact be the younger population because it allows for better remodeling of the transfer of the transfer greater trochanter. And I tend to agree with him because most of the patients that in our series, the younger the child was, the better the chance of getting a good result because you had many years for allowing the trochanter to remodel into the shape of a femoral head. So the advantages of this procedure to my mind is that at least in the short or medium term, a fairly stable, painless and functional hip can be obtained. Definitely the gait is improved with lessening of the abductor lurch. More importantly, that very severe instability and vertical telescopy that the hallmark of this condition is obliterated. It definitely lessens the limb length discrepancy and provides a stable fulcrum for future limb lengthening procedures. So we are also believe that in select cases, if you have the right selection criteria, this is a worthwhile procedure to consider. And I definitely feel and agree with Perry Shoniker's observation that the younger child tends to benefit more from this procedure than if you do it in a child who's closer to skeletal maturity. So thank you very much for your attention.